Welcome back. I'm Dylan McGee. I'm the founder and executive producer of Makers. And we have today my friends Abby and Glennon, Abby Wambach and Glennon Doyle. And this is um, a real thrill for me. Um, but let's start with Abby. Abby, um, you know, of course, you know, extraordinary Olympian. She is also an author, Wolfpack. Um, this book is, you know, get out and buy this right away. Um, it's sort of the perfect size. You can carry with it with you wherever you go. Um, so Abby, we're excited to see you. And then we have the one and only Glennon Doyle. Look at this book, everybody. It just came out and thank God it did. This really is getting me through and we'll talk to her um, about all about it, but it is, um, it's really just a gift to all of us um, right now. Okay, Glennon and Abby, here we come. Here they come, waiting, connecting. Poof! Dylan, we did it! I'm so happy! All right, how are you? Hi. Hi, you two. How are you? Well, your hair looks a little different right now, Glennon, than it did this morning. I feel like maybe you... you oh, yes. I, mm -hmm. What I did was I took a shower. Oh, good. I'm doing that every few days. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. That's and then our 11-year-old daughter has been braiding my hair each day. I like day. that. Yes. You know, I've been dressing up yes. for, the, for the guests. I know. Well, should we have a room? Yeah. Daughter? Okay. I wanted to show them my my look with the black and the gray, and then the white. Um, this is Corona hair. <laughs> Abby, Nothing you're keeping that though. hat on. Yes, there's a reason. <laughs> I actually just ordered some clippers so that I could shave the sides. I'm getting a little squirrely, is what we call it in the, the short hair world. So Corona hair. Well, I we're just gonna do what we can do. What can we do? I've been um, I've been dressing up a little for our guests. For Gloria, I wore the shirt about her movie, The Glorias. Um, with Cameron, I put on a jean jacket that felt r really fancy. But for you, mm -hmm. Glennon, I have I'm not trying to get all like you know. It's not a bra. It's what is it? <laughs> boobs? You have boobs for no, me? Oh, black not, tank top. It's the tank top. It's the Glennon tank top for you. Yes, Dylan. Do you know? I decided a long time ago that men figured out that if they have the same outfit they wear all over and over and over again, that they don't have to freaking think about it every day. So I have 30 black tank tops. I wear them every single day. And also, I am the sweatiest sweater that ever sweated, so I can't wear t-shirts. No. I can't wear t-shirts because I sweat through them. Are they the ones with the silken so bra? Um, no, I have a bra on. It's got a little cheap. Okay, okay, okay. 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 anyway. Sorry. Sorry, my first people. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's do, we want, let's talk, I want to talk about this book, and then mm. I want to talk about the kind of, what we're doing with everyone, the three things that are getting us all through. But let's, like, let's just gobble yeah. this. Let's just gobble this up. Can we, for a minute? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about the cons. I mean, first of all, I feel like, in all sincerity, that you know, I believe in things happen for a reason. And I, mm. while I, I can imagine how hard it is to have this book come out right now, it is mm. such a gift to the world. Um, mm. And it is so the timing is just amazing and so selfishly for all of us we're grateful um to have you and it's mm -hmm. it's written in such a way that there are these little nuggets of chapters and what's funny mm -hmm. is usually an interviewer is like oh yeah well i read the book but i i'm starting to hear a lot of people say i i just want to get through a couple of because i want it to last right mm -hmm. i know you don't want, want it to be done yeah oh that's so so nice. tell us about this concept of untamed and the cheetah and the pink bunny yeah well i mean i think i've been untaming for a long time but when i met this one um this voice just came up in me i don't know if it was words or just like this knowing it just there she is the second i saw her just 
there she is. And, um, and I know that it was my true voice that I was hearing for the first time since I was a child. You know, I think that who I truly was was buried beneath all of these layers of expectations that people had for me and all the shoulds and supposed tos and um, ideals for womanhood. Um, and so the question for me became, okay, am I going to honor this self or am I going to abandon myself again? You know, am, am I going to abandon all the world's expectations for me or myself? You know, am I going to keep being a good girl or am I going to learn how to be a free woman? Um, and so what I, I was scared to death because for many reasons, but, you know, mostly because I was tamed to believe that a good mother doesn't break up her family. Right. Right. That a good mother would, will abandon herself just to not cause anyone else any pain. Um, and then one day I was braiding my daughter's hair and I thought, oh, I'm staying in this marriage for her. But would I want this marriage for her? And if I wouldn't want the marriage that I'm in for my little girl, then why am I modeling bad love and calling that good mothering? And I realized that this taming we have, you know, I was tamed to believe that a good mother is a martyr, right? That what a good mother does is just bury herself and her needs and her ambitions and her dreams and her desires and her emotions and call that love, right? In honor of her children, right? And what a burden for, for the children of martyr mothers to bear, to be the reason that their mother stopped living, mm. right? To know that if they decide to become parents, they too will have to slowly die. Mm -hmm for their children, because if we hold up motherhood as the epitome, I'm sorry, martyrdom as the epitome of motherhood, that's what they will feel like they should do too. Right. We're taming them, right? Ugh. Which is Ugh. why Carl Jung said that there's no greater burden on a child than the unlived life of a parent. Hmm. Ooh, oh, she's gonna good. drop that right there. <laughs> right, so, so, so becoming untamed for me is very simple. It's that women, Little girl, from the moment we're born, we are taught all of these things I call dirty pink bunnies, which is another, it's from the book, but like things we're supposed to chase our whole lives, how to be a good girl, how to be a good woman, how to be a good partner, how to be a good wife, how to be a good um, Christian or whatever religion you are, how to be a good um, mother. And the thing is that all of those categories are just telling us to disappear. Mm -hmm. in a million different ways. That's why a good mother is a martyr because that's just a way to make women disappear. Right. Right. So untaming it's, 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 um, becoming untamed is something that it's living an examined life. It's, it's figuring out what roots were planted beneath you by people who were meant to control you. Right. It's doing what Walt Whitman said, which is just reexamining everything that we learned in a book, in right. a church, in the world and dismissing whatever insults our souls. And it's active, right? I mean, it's not just like, what I sort of love about it is now that I have this concept in my head, I, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, it's a journey. Like, how do I untame myself? How mm -hmm. do I let go of all those things? How do I identify what those mm -hmm. things are? I mean, I've started reading this. I'm like, okay, what are all the rules that have been put into this head? And so that now I can have a, like, an untamed is such a way, of, it's just such a tangible way to think about it, right? Well, the story, the metaphor that I used for it in the beginning is Abby and I took the girls to um, a safari park a while back. And we went to this thing called the Cheetah Run. And we were, um, watched this, this zookeeper brings out this black lab, okay, at the Cheetah Run. And she says, is this a cheetah? And all the kids are like, no. And she's like, this, you're right. This is Minnie. This is the black lab. We raised this uh, dog alongside Tabitha, the cheetah, to tame her. So now everything that, um, that Minnie, the lab does, Tabitha wants to do. Okay? So first, the Minnie, the lab, is going to run the race, and then Tabitha will. So Minnie runs the race. We watch her. And then they pull Tabitha out of the cage. And she's, Dylan, she's so freaking powerful and beautiful. And she's just like walking to the starting, little starting line. And her muscles are rippling. She's so majestic. And then the zookeeper blows this whistle. 
and this Jeep takes off with this dirty pink bunny tied to it. And this beautiful majestic creature just chases this dirty pink bunny through this well-worn path while we all clap for her. And I just watched that and I thought, oh, if a cheetah, if a wild animal like a cheetah can be tamed to forget who she is, to forget her wild and spend her entire life chasing dirty pink bunnies, so can a woman. Mm. Right? So that's what we do. They give us our dirty pink bunnies in the beginning. Be small, be quiet, be agreeable, be, be sexy, be beautiful, be... Uh, and then um, we spend our entire lives chasing those things. And that's why uh, we're tired and overwhelmed and without purpose and peace. And so the idea is to just stop the freaking chase. Because it's left us weary. Just stop like, chasing all the dirty pink bunnies. Stop chasing those dirty pink bunnies. Yeah. yeah. That's Abby, if, if you identify dirty pink bunnies in your life through this journey. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I have, I, I was part of the very early process of editing the book, editing the book, and I read it, I feel like a year ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that has been most fascinating is this internal exploration of what the seeds are and what, what was planted long ago that you've just accepted as normal. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that for me, you know, we're feminists and we're out in the world talking about feminism and I'm talking about equal pay and equal, equal treatment for women in the workplace. And I find myself um, even having thought processes that still marginalize mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. right? Um, for instance, I was having a, a text conversation with my agent recently and he was like, I was going to do some work at a university and I said, Oh, the professor, what's his name? And he just wrote back. It's actually a woman, you a hole. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, oh my gosh. that's exactly right. And right. so it's just like these little moments, these insidious mm -hmm. thoughts or belief systems that we think that we own and that we believe to be true for our own selves yep. aren't our own. They've been, right. they've been put into us yes. by, the masses, by the culture, by the, the history of humanity that is marginalized, not just women, but, but a lot of people. Um, so for me, it's been, it's been a wild exploration for sure. And, it, and so it really, fun to talk about. It's so fun to talk about. And really it does, I think, you know, especially right now, um, I just feel like it's, it's, uh, it's also sort of scary in some ways, because I, I listened to you this morning and you had this great thing, Glennon, about the snow globe, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we're active and we're out in the world and we're just sort of doing our things and we're, you know, we're following all these rules and, but then all of a sudden the snow settles mm -hmm. and that's really unsettling yeah. and finding yourself and relearning can be stressful, right? Yeah, and then when you when you're just chasing pink bunnies all the time, it's like returning to yourself and sitting with your feelings and admitting to yourself that you do have discontent and longing and yearning is scary as hell because once you admit that you can imagine more for yourself, there's no going back. Right? Right. Yes. Right? right. Once you sit with like actually this relationship isn't as beautiful as I think a relationship should be. Actually, this job is like, I can imagine more. I have a deeper longing. I have blah, blah, blah. Then you, you, once you, once you get to the knowing, the, the doing is next. Mm -hmm. And that's so scary because women are taught to just be grateful for what we have, right? right. Just be grateful. Just, it's good enough. It's good enough. Just be grateful, you know? So, you know, the first story I ever learned was Adam and Eve. Like, everything will be cool as long as a woman doesn't want more. But if she does, all suffering will be unleashed on the earth forever. Like, we are taught from the very beginning, do not want more. And when we admit that we have any inner discontent, that is our admission that we want more. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, when we dare to speak the more, shit outside gets weird. Right? Right? <laughs> right? right. Like, people are cool. used to us being in our cage. And once we start to say we want more in our relationships, in our homes, in our communities, in our nation, then we're, 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 we're what are we? We're shrill, we're emotional, we're um, bossy, we're, we're all the things because we've stepped out of our cage, right? 
And I think that's very real. The resistance that comes to a woman who says, no, I want more in a million different ways. They will call you names. They will do all of these things. There's a price to pay. But there's a price to pay by, by not saying it. Right. That's the thing. It's not, we'll be fine if we say nothing. It's no. If we say something, there will be a price to pay. But if we don't, there will be a higher price to pay, which is that we slowly die and we don't live the one wild and precious life we've been given. Mm -hmm. Well, and by the way, these, as you point out, these, these feelings, like I love when you talk about how this woman came to you and said, you know, feelings are there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was like news to me. I was an addict my whole life. So my, my existence was about not feeling. Right. When I was a little kid, super sensitive kid. I had huge feelings and my I started overeating and drinking to not feel all of that. Right. So when I finally got sober, yeah, I went to my uh, fifth meeting on my sixth day of sobriety and I said, hi, I'm Glennon and um, I'm sober for six days and I feel awful and terrible and horrible. And um, I think that maybe the problem wasn't my drinking. Maybe the problem was me that I just don't, I can't figure life out. Like, it's just, it feels harder for me than it is for everyone else. And um, I feel like I'm missing some secret that everybody else has. And it's just hard. And that's all. And then this woman came up to me after the meeting and she said, I just want you to know something that someone told me in the beginning of sobriety, which is that you're not, it's not hard because you're doing it wrong. It's hard because you're finally doing it right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That, that feelings, even the hard ones are all for feeling. Right. That, um, that if there's any secret, it's just that being fully human and feeling all of your feelings without numbing, without deflecting, without running from them, it's just really hard. That's why so few people do it. Right. Right. That's the secret. Right. Um, and right. it is hard to feel it all, but the only thing that's harder than feeling it all is missing it all. Mm. Right. Right. Ah. Right. I mean, we hear this perspective, uh, you know, so beautifully through Glennon about how when she met you, Abby, there, you know, all those feelings came up and, you know, what her finding her true self. I'm, I want to hear from you what that day was like for you. It was very similar, um, quite frankly. It, um, you know, she she stood up on the other side of this table, <laughs> literally, like she 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 stood up and was like, and had her arms wide open, and it put me in an awkward position because I was like, well, I have to go over there because she's calling for me <laughs> to embrace her. Ellen, we never spoke it. She just walked into the room, and I stood up like that. Okay, if the Queen of England had walked in the room, it would have been an extra reaction. <laughs> so I like, you know, so like shuffle my way around the whole table, I finally get to her and, you know, we embrace and from the minute that we met, there was an instant energy and instant connection. And, um, you know, I remember getting back into my car and going back to the hotel after that night. And I was like, that was so weird. <laughs> And then, you know, she emailed me a couple days later because I was super new in my sobriety. Um, this is like, I, I mean, maybe a month I'm sober. I'm, yeah. I just had my four year birthday of yes. sobriety yesterday. And Glennon at the time, she was, you know, 12, 13 years sober. And um, I felt like she had, she had knowledge about sobriety that I needed to learn. Um, so of course, like initially I thought, well, maybe we're just going to be friends and she's going to be like a, a sober friend of mine, but the world took us in a different direction. <laughs> Thank did. God. Thank God. All of us. <sighs> yeah. We're a gift to each other. As Glennon says, like what I really found was myself. And so it became a gift to me. And then it's a gift to all of us because mm. your openness and authenticity is just helping us all grow. Um, I want to do one sort of like light and fluffy thing. Oh. Can we talk about the, t the, the cover? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. Dumb. And it's so Cover's different so and unique. Like what's the story? 
So covers are so hard and, um, and I always hate it the biggest amount. Right? Like <laughs> the most amount I hate. She's not exaggerating. Trying really? to find covers. <clears throat> yeah. And um, this woman, so, so this woman from, from my publisher, she came to speak, to see me speak somewhere. Okay. This is so wild. And she, the day after she saw me speak, she found this piece of art that she loved, okay? Put a pin in that. Months and months and months later, she gets a request from my publisher to make the cover for Untamed. And she has read my stuff forever and she has come to, to speaking. So she had this piece of art that reminded her of me, which was this cover. Yes. It's so good. So, so she, and the second, like, my publisher sent me a bunch of covers, and this was in the thing, and I was like, that's it. That's what my insides look like. That's it. Someone, <laughs> that's an x-ray. Someone took an x-ray of my insides, and that's what it is. But the but an x-ray of everyone's insides, right? I love how it's so wild. Her name is Lynn Buckley. Lynn Buckley. Lynn Buckley. And I got to meet Lynn um, on my publishing day um, during my 24-hour book tour. <laughs> <laughs> that got canceled. By Corona, um, and we just cried. We just sat in that room and cried. I don't know. It was just like this moment of beauty oh, between love, two women I, who made this thing together. I wanted to know that story, and I love yeah. the concept of this is what your insides look like. I really like. I yeah, I, I, I have glitter on my insides. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> Dylan, your I, your insides are almost completely glitter. <laughs> if, she, if, she, if Lennon could like dust glitter in our house, she would, but I will not allow it. <laughs> but did you, so what is it, I mean, you, we laugh and you say, you know, my 24 hour book tour, um, but mm -hmm. what, how are you processing that you've launched this book, which by the way, I mean, Reese Witherspoon just selected it. Congratulations. Um, it's New York Times bestseller, Amazon bestseller. I mean, you're rocking um, from your- Yeah, life. it's good, it's good. So what, mm -hmm. what have you learned from having to completely rethink your book tour and what's that journey been like for both of you? I mean, what I learned from this is what I've learned from every other decade or year of my life, which is that you can plan things and good luck with that, <laughs> right? Like, there, you, like, life is just about being so, you know, preparing and planning and then just, just surrendering <laughs> completely to whatever the hell happens next. I mean, our, we planned this for a year and a half. I have oh been planning God. this for 30 years, okay? This book is everything that I've been trying to say for the last 30 years. Um, but then it's like... <laughs> You know, we were in a we were in a hotel room, and we were early cancelers. Okay, this was like a few weeks ago when people still weren't canceling. Um, but like the team was giving me all this information, and I just we were in a hotel room, and I kept thinking, I cannot cancel this. This book is the most beautiful thing that I've ever made in my professional career. And then I, it just didn't sound right to me, and it, I realized, oh no 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 no, it's not. The most beautiful thing that I have created in my professional career is the community of people mm -hmm. that are going to come to these events. Right. So, so then it was like this. There was no more angst. There was no, there was sadness, but it was clear as day. Like, of course, we put people in every, in, in a, families, in communities, in nations. Well, anyway, we should in nations. Right. Put always, always put people above whatever the uh, whatever whatever else is we're prioritizing. So money, money, right? So, um, so yeah. So then it was sad, but very, very clear. And um, I just shifted gears. Really, I just was like, okay, what can I do to show up for my community right now? Because, I mean, you know, like together rising, like we're just people are losing so freaking much. It's very real, and the pain is. Mm -hmm is incredible and widespread and just, we just shift, right? We just shift to serving each other right now. Right. But sorry it's, guys, this is our job. I know, and I, I, I'm sorry to like interrupt this, but like you have to understand, Glennon has been petting Honey's head. Honey so, hates it. She wants nothing to do with it. 
and uh, Honey is like trying to get away because Glennon gets into her. Okay, thing okay, she's all right, she's, she's gone. I'm trying to. I am full of love, and <laughs> this doll. She was traumatizing me back. If it's the last. No, you were traumatizing her. She was like, her eyes were like coming out of her face. All right, whatever. <laughs> wait, wait, can we talk about love? I, the, the moment that you two, your Care Bear moment. Oh my God, I have to say I laughed so hard. I don't, I didn't, I don't need to laugh at your suffering, Glennon. But when you were staring at Abby and, and saying like, I'm just not feeling the love and where are the Care Bears? And then Abby looks at you and is like, well, I mean, we couldn't be any closer right now. We are so isolating and I love you. Glennon, you need a lot of love. We love you. And speak. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. That's okay. Yeah, and I've stopped pretending that I don't. All right. I'm no longer doing the whole, like, oh, I'm too much thing. No, I just, I am a human being who can be quarantined with you for 18 days and still feel distant. <laughs> so I, got I just need to I feel love the love. Yeah, but you have to understand the other thing about this, that... There is nobody on the planet that shoots more Care Bear love to you than you, than me. Right. So for this to even be brought up in a conversation was disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, wait, can we talk about the Care Bear? Because Abby, what I am sensing from you over these devices, which is as much connection as we can get, um, is that when, when this book tour had to change, like you were like, I'm going to be there for Glennon and I am going to do whatever it takes in my power. And you have been like emoting Care Bear vibes for this book and for Glennon, like a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for seeing me. I see you. <laughs> I love you. It's really, you know, she's a three Enneagram. No, four. Four. I'm a three. And it is, she's the love of my life. Yes. And also... I am heartbroken for her and, and her team who've spent countless hours prepping for this beautiful work of art. Um, and when there's a hiccup, it's like, okay, we've got to pivot. But I just want to be as like loving and present with her because every single day, something new, something isn't working out technologically. And we were all like getting MBAs in technology right now. Like what the heck, who knew how to do any of this stuff? Um, so I just, I'm so grateful that her book is getting the attention it deserves, um, because I see how much time she put into this and I have seen how much of her heart she has shared in the process of her own becoming untamed. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, you know, and, and it's very cool because when I first met you, it, things were different. You yes. were, yeah, you were very different. I was very different. I was very different. See, you're yeah. becoming Are you, 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 you were doing what, what were you going to say? Yeah, you have eyelashes and makeup. I knew you were going to say that. She says, you were very different. <laughs> yeah, I was. I used to wear a shit ton of makeup, and now I only wear tinted moisturizer because that's not makeup, that's medicine. That's makeup. That's <laughs> medicine. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Like, and you get to do what you want. Like, yeah. you get to decide if it's for you. That's what this book right. is. That's right. I if, do what I want. If you have unearthed this yeah. and planted the seed yourself, then you get to do whatever you want. That's right. I'm happy to hear you don't have it all figured out, Glennon. I hear your coach right there. Yeah. And yeah. neither do I. Nobody does, P.S. Nobody, no, does. nobody does. Um, okay. So tell me, what are the three things getting you two through this? Okay. So one of the things that I struggle the most with um, is maintaining a consistent workout regimen. And before this happened, I was training for a marathon that got canceled. And now I'm still training for the New York City Marathon that hopefully is going to stay strong. So I'm going to show you my running shoes. That's what I'm doing. That's yeah. Amazing. How and, and what's a run for you? How far are you going? Well, I was doing 18 miles, 20 miles a couple of weeks ago. And um, now since this, this most near uh, marathon got postponed, I, I, this week was seven miles every day, just getting a little bit faster every day. You're really slacking there. Seven miles, Abby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. two miles. I feel so good. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, well, I am maintaining my, um, my disciplined dedication to not running. <laughs> um, I have, I have heard from many experts that it's important to keep consistency. So I am staying consistent to not running. <laughs> um, and additionally, you work out every day on the elliptical. I do do the elliptical while I watch trash TV. Um, and I actually, um, I have ha had a long history of food and body issues, um, bulimia, all, all of it. And so I think that a lot of food stuff is coming up for people in quarantine, you know, and I know it is for me. Um, just all of those things that, that I thought I had figured out a little bit, um, now in the face of all the fear and uncertainty are really bubbling up, like, you know, hoarding and scarcity and fear of wasting and overeating and undereating. So I'm just actually really working on being extremely tender with myself mm, and true. just not yep. judging myself for any of it. And just realizing that we, is, we are in a tough time and we're just going to keep starting over each day. Um, the other thing that I'm doing is I started this kind of quarantine, just it's kind of my personality. I want to like come out of this better than, uh, than I started. So I don't want to like waste time. So I like signed up for that Yale um, well-being course um, online that you could do for free. Um, you know, we're trying to make sure we figure out how to do the online e-learning stuff for our kids so that they don't fall behind. Just trying to make sure that I'm doing all the things so that when I'm done, I'll say, oh, that was worth it, you know? Mm -hmm. What about you? Well, I brought something to show you that is I'm getting me through because you did the things to get me through. This is my medication. <laughs> this is my Lexapro. <laughs> um, again, staying consistent. I will tell you that um, Abby noticed so like last week she was like, what, what? You're so calm. She's like, you, I have struggled with anxiety and depression my whole life. Um, and she said, you know, it's like the kids don't text you back for four minutes and you freak out, but a global pandemic and you're cool as a cucumber. Right? So weird to say. What's happening? I'm right. like, I'm like up and down. Like what the heck? She's just fine. Yeah. So I think it's because I, Dylan have lived with depression and anxiety my whole life and being a person who's both depressed and anxious is very confusing. It's like being um, being Eeyore and Tigger at the exact same time. <laughs> it's like it's like I'm so sad, but really excited about it, but so sad, but really excited. It's like this constant, and so and so I my whole life have been explaining myself to people, and um, it's been a little bit like Chicken Little, you know, like this guy for me. I'm like the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and everyone's like. It's okay, just smile. And now everybody's like, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And I'm kind of like, uh-huh. How do you like me now? Right? So we're welcome to my world. Come on in. Right? So there is, like, I actually talked to several of my friends who who struggle with uh, depression and anxiety, and a lot of them are saying the same thing, that it feels like we've lived on a level nine our whole lives and now the whole world is kind of at least at a seven and we actually feel like we have stuff to offer right now because yeah. i actually know how to keep showing up and how to be um you know do life while i'm scared because i've been doing it since i was 10. it's amazing so i have been doing these morning meetings on my instagram that are just like I don't know. I, I don't know why. I just thought, okay, I can help with this because I'm. I know what it's like to be a highly sensitive person who who um, is dealing with anxiety, and that's what everyone is right now. Um, and so that's getting me through because each morning I can just. I mean, Abby knows. I just wake up in the morning and like try to have like a Mister Rogers moment for all of us. Um, I love them. Yeah, it makes me feel like I've done something. Mostly you know, it's for up. me. Like. She's doing it for me because she knows that I'm, I, I am a student of Glennon's, like, more than anybody. So my third thing is mm -hmm. that's getting me through is I've actually been listening to Glennon's book on tape, on audiobook, <clears throat> and um, that really makes 
this whole process a lot easier in my mind. I don't know because I might be an auditory learner, but this book has really helped me. And this is like a perfect time for women to excavate themselves mm -hmm. and figure out some of this stuff. Um, you know, it's not even a shameless plug. It's like a real deal. Like I'm actually listening to my wife when I'm running. People might think that that's weird, but I don't. I feel the Care Bear love. That's see, <laughs> see. I was there gonna go. say, I'm feeling the Care Bear love. I hope you are, Glennon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then the last thing that I would say that's getting us through is Craig. He's our co-parent. So we, he's my ex-husband and Arthur. So we have, um, I don't know if anyone else has noticed during quarantine, but this is a lot of family togetherness. Okay. <laughs> so um, I do not think that this much family togetherness was God's plan for us. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, I'm going through sobriety. No, everything in moderation, especially children. I just, so, um, so we are grateful, yada, 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 for the children. Um, but we are also grateful for Craig who comes to get them every few days. And um, it's just a great situation. It's good. Yeah, it's good. yeah. Grateful for three parents. We love our family. Three parents is the way to go, you guys, <laughs> at least. What do we do? Well, thank you for having you. us. Yeah, you too. All right. Well, thank you for doing this and for being here. And remember, everybody, this, but all we love you, Dylan. Care Bear. Oh, wait. The Care Bear couple. They're best together. The Care Bear couple. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's a new hashtag. Hashtag Care Bear couple. Yes. All right. My you dreams too. are coming true. Well, we love you. Thank you for having us. You. We love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.